what to say. <laughs> All right. Do we um are we set up for Josh? Um got plenty of time. So uh, I'm Samir Verma, I'm a professor uh, in the Information Systems Department at San Francisco State University. Which is a that needs to be reported. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, so I've been there for a while, many years now, and one of the things I've been doing is working with one laptop or child. So I figured I would give you an overview of things, kind of tell you where things are, where we are headed, and of course where we need help. Um, They know that I'm not just going to talk about OPC, but also about sugar. Sugar is the learning platform that comes with the laptop. And uh, the three important aspects is collaborative, so that's very important, uh, joyful, and of course, self empowered. So these are sort of the three points of focus we have within the project. Uh, this picture is uh, from a school in Jamaica, one of the schools that I work with. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about these things in a few minutes. All right, so um, like I told you, I'm a professor. There. I've been there about 13 years. Um, I'm, uh, I've gone through the tenure and promotion cycles in some way this late. Well, I'm, I'm tenure full professor now, one way to the next. Uh, but that's a wonderful place to be because now it's like I can do a lot of fun things, right? such as work on projects like this, and then also try to see if I can bring these into the classroom, into my research, and that in itself is an experience to you know, combine the, 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 the different areas together. Uh, to give you an idea, these are some of the things that I, I teach. I'm in the business school, but we do get, get fairly technical on things. So for instance, I teach computer networks and we go through the entire stack and then my students will actually use Wireshark 
to look up the whole stack to figure out, you know, encryption and tunnels and this and that. So for a business school, it's a little uh, uh, unheard of, but they will go that deep into some of the technology, but I'll do it like that. I also teach a course called uh, Managing Open Source, which is where the, the reference to bills, you know, how many Linux kernels are there, comes in. And we look at... Um, have, you, have you run that script again since? <laughs> Actually, you don't know. I haven't. Okay. But that would be a, a good test to go back and see if it still works. Right? Um, uh, so in this course, we look at licensing and uh, we look at business models. We look at the community side of it. We also look at the use of free and open source in the, in the enterprise, corporate side, universities, hospitals, and so on. And then, of course, look at the different collaborative models. Uh, as part of the curriculum, I also sometimes teach courses in the area of uh, IT strategy and audit, governance, and so on. Not as exciting, but uh, you know, that's one of the things that you do have to go through. So that's sort of the, the spectrum of the things I teach. Um, in terms of research, if I have to put a label on it, this is sort of what it's been, which is how does uh, anything that's innovative, any innovative technology diffuse through a community, and then why do people adopt it? So you know, there are certain things where they may appear to be technologically superior, yet the, uh, the, the community or society at large gravitate towards something else. You know, typically you say, shiny cells. Why does shiny cell? Uh, and so there are interesting sort of theories behind that. So that's been my area of research. And lately I've applied that to the field of uh, free and open source software and look at specific cases where uh, the adoption has been better. In terms of the service uh, to campus and community, I've been running this project for about three years now called the Commons Initiative at SF State, where we look at all kinds of projects that are free software, open source, creative commons across the campus, uh, connect the dots, get people introduced. You know, it's harder than you, uh, you think. Uh, you're on the same campus, but everybody sort of does their own thing. And then bring them together to see if we have common ideas and some you know, things that we can work together. And then also do some work upstream, uh, if you will. So we work with the Internet Archive on some projects. We work with Creative Commons, Wikimedia Foundation, and so on. So uh, lots of interesting things happening in that space. Uh, the group we have in uh, San Francisco is OPC San Francisco. Well, not that, but, uh, San Francisco, it's a volunteer community, so we're not um, a, a company. So we are not, for instance, like OPC Australia, which is a which is a company that implements OPC in Australia. We are, we are still a volunteer group. Um, we meet once a month, sort of like what you folks do here with your group. Um, and uh, we host the annual uh, global summit for OPC. So all the volunteer community and so on gather once a year in October at San Francisco State, where we use the whole weekend and run the summit. So that has been uh, one of the bigger things that we do. Um, the group in San Francisco, um, so it's a lot of different people and they work on a lot of different projects, but most of their projects are outside of the country. So, for instance, we have, we have somebody who works or has worked before uh, on an OBC project in Afghanistan, uh, or Honduras, or Madagascar, or Uganda, and so on. And you'll see I say San Francisco at the very bottom because that's a wish list. Uh, it's, it, it's the most difficult thing to do to get this thing to work in San Francisco. I, it, it's amazing. Uh, the barriers are, are tremendous. Um, the school district is incredibly difficult to work with. Um, They're waiting for the iPads to win them? <laughs> well, that's part of the issue, which is everybody wants, you know, the shiny stuff. Um, and then it's a massive bureaucracy, especially in the public school system side right, of things. So it's very difficult to figure out what's your entry point and then who makes the decision. So you may, for instance, work with the principal who would be excited and say, this is great, I would love if you could do this for the school. And you know what, I cannot actually make that happen. Okay. Right? <laughs> so we've had a lot of those, those dead-end conversations. Um, so it's, the interest is definitely there. Um, in fact, last week was an Hour of Code event going on. Oh, was that last week? So, yeah, so I went to my kid's school um, and we did Scratch with some of the schools there, uh, or some of the classes there. And it was very difficult to get started, but after one teacher said, okay, and that classroom did scratch, the word you know, got out. By the time I got home, I got an email from another teacher saying, can you come back tomorrow? And so we went on doing that, and it spilled over into this week. Nice. So I did one today, and I'm doing one on Wednesday. So, 
So it does work, but you have to figure out how to get into the system. I think you just need to get your substitute teaching credential. <laughs> yeah, we'll welcome you with open arms. Right. I think that's that's actually a very a very good idea because I've seen that that's how people do get into the school system to introduce newer ideas as either a sub or as a volunteer. You know, like a group volunteer. And you're, and you're, oh, sorry. And you're already credentialed. Yeah. So I they can so. leave you in the room by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you know nothing about what's going on in the class. So when, when you go, are you using their labs to do scratch? Or? Yes. So we go into the library where they have 25 computers. And the class comes in. And so in most cases, there are 22 children. Uh, the typical prescribed size, but sometimes you have more, so they'll bring in some extra laptops out of the closet to just a supplement. Um, and so we, we use Scratch. Now, I'll talk a little bit about that later, but it was very interesting to use Scratch because Scratch now works in a browser, which means I do not have to install because you cannot install anything on those computers. Right? The, the rights are kind of like this by the unified school district, so nobody can install anything, but Scratch works in a browser and it's, it's a hit. It's massive. So, so yeah, someday we'll get into some school in San Francisco. Fingers crossed. Uh, I directly work with a handful of projects. Uh, the main ones are India, Jamaica, and Madagascar. Uh, we did a lot of work for Armenia, and then they sort of got moving. Uh, we did some translation stuff. But there's a big, something like 10,000 laptop project in Armenia that's, that got started. And then there is a very, very small project in the country of Tuba. Did we go to Tuba? Oh, Tuba. Richard Feynman. This thing about going to this place called Tuba. Which called uh, So Tuba is uh, between Mongolia and Russia. It's, it's, it, it, it's evidently the geographical center of Asia. They actually have a monument to this in their city. And uh, it's known for throat singing. There's a, a lot of people, you know, they, they can produce multiple notes. But anyway, we know somebody who knows somebody. And then these people were part of the, I guess, the original Feynman team. So they were going to uh, Tuba. And so we got to talking and then it was like, okay, let's take a few laptops. So we send a few laptops to Tuba and there's a very small school that has some of these. Uh, so again, hopefully that will grow. Uh, this is my project in India, in a small village called Bhakrapur. Uh, this, uh, this is my mother's village, so this is where my mother's family comes from. Uh, so we, we've been in that village since like 1400 something generations. So a big advantage which is it's a small social community, but you know everybody and you can get things done. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about this. Uh, this is one of the schools in Jamaica where we've been working. Uh, so I've now got four schools in Jamaica. This was the first one. Um, I'll tell you, tell you a little bit about this. And then this is the school in Cuba. You can see uh, the kids are having fun with some math there. Uh, OLBC itself, for those of you who are new to this, um, They've been around for a while. 2005 is when they sort of got started, and they're a nonprofit 501c3, uh, which is the OPC Foundation in Cambridge. And then there is a 501c4, which is operations, which is in Miami. So they're sort of split into two groups. Um, what, what is the four? Four is the operations wing. So it's like. Well, what, what, what is that in the. Uh, oh, in terms of what they do? In the IRS code. I don't, I don't know exactly, but they're classified as three versus four, and so three does all the foundation stuff, but four does, you know, like things of, like getting the level of credit, the manufacturing, the shipping, logistics, okay. all of those things. Um, so in terms of, you know, like the amount of work that happens, the nature of work is very different. The foundation in Cambridge does all the, you know, engineering and innovation, whereas Miami does production, shipping, deliveries, and deployment, and so on. Um, so that's OPC, and uh, there's sort of a long winded mission statement, but that's sort of the core of it, which is empower the world's children through education. So the goal has been always uh, to focus on education. The device is, is, is a medium, and of course, the, as with everything else, there are lots of stories with these things. But uh, because, because it is so difficult to observe, education happening in a community in a short period of time, people tend to focus on what you can see, which is, oh, look at this. You know, so there's always been that point of contention in our project, which is, you know, uh, this is not a laptop project, this is an education project. But there's always a lot of focus on the technology because this takes a ton of work to make, make it happen, but then the education part will take several years to actually even see if it works. 
um, so that has been a difficult uh, part of this. Um, in terms of numbers, it's always tricky to figure out the numbers, um, but these are the comfortable ones. Over 40 countries, over 30 languages, uh, about 3 million laptops, and something like 350 plus applications that are delivered. And the applications that are delivered here use this um, learning system called Sugar. It's produced by Sugar Labs, um, another nonprofit that came out of the OLPC project. And then they so started spun off. all of these. They spun off uh, because of some early disagreement about which way the project should go and the fact that uh, they wanted to make sure that the software platform remains free and open. And so they said, okay, we'll go off and create uh, the software side of it, you guys run the box, and then of course, there's all. But even now, there's a very, very strong relationship between the two groups because um, there are too many things to fix. It's not one of those things where you just install it and it's ready to go. So, um, now this is one of those points where, um, and I've, so I've done a few presentations to groups like yours, but I've also done presentations to ministers in the Ministry of Education. And the one thing that strikes me always as very interesting and different is that usually this is the only project in the room uh, in terms of any bid process or any of those things where it is actually grounded in education. It started in education. Pretty much everything else is, it started off as something else, an entertainment system or an office productivity system or something like that and then retrofitted to education. So whether it is Android or Chrome OS, uh, or Google Education, any of those things, they all started off someplace else, and then it was like, let's make it work in the classroom, whereas this started exactly with education, you know, not for an entertainment system in the car and those things. And so that makes a big difference because the focus has always been on learning. Um, around the world, the profile is quite varied and different. Uh, we see all kinds of communities. Uh, you will see schools where children wear a uniform. So for instance here you will see they have some kind of a uniform, but then you know that doesn't mean that they actually come from a middle class community or an affluent community. It's the government perhaps you know issues uniforms. Uh, whereas other places you will find a school where it doesn't even have a classroom. Forget the uniform part of it. Uh, there are others where you, you see not just the uniform of the classroom but a full curriculum and teachers and textbooks and, and the works. So this is in Nigeria from the early days. One of the things you'll see is none of these laptops actually have a logo on there. If you look closely, they actually do, but it's in white, so you don't get to see it like you see it here. And that's because this is from, those machines are probably from like 2007 or so, so maybe 2006, so early. Um, that's uh, one of the early batches in Thailand. Um, they were sitting together playing music, and so each child would play a different instrument. But the network is designed in a way where it meshes, so they all are on the same network, and they can synchronize the beat system. So every laptop would have the same beat, although they would have a different instrument, so you'd be able to play together. Uh, that's a small school in India. I visited them in 2008, and then in 2013. It's a one-room school with 31 children, and one teacher who teaches everything. Uh, they borrow electricity from the neighbor because they don't have any of their own. So they run a cable like that orange one when they charge. No furniture, they all sit on the floor of those mats there. Uh, but then they're able to use their laptops on the network and they've effectively switched off the usage of the blackboard. So the chalk and board is largely gone. Uh, pretty much ha everything happens with the machine. Mongolia was one of the early ones. They have a, <coughs> they have a, a few thousand, I don't remember exactly how many, but this was a government-driven initiative, so they, this was top-down. Uh, they did the first round, and then they couldn't get funding for the second one. So this is still there, but it hasn't grown. Uh, Ethiopia has had several different projects. They're done by different agencies. Uh, this was one of the challenging ones because they had to translate uh, the keyboard layout and the script, so they had to do Amharic, and that was a major challenge in the early days, that they delivered these things with Amharic on the keyboard. Uh, this is in Pakistan, but this is uh, Afghani refugees. So these are the ones who came across from Afghanistan, and they go to a refugee camp, got no place to go, and so they made a makeshift school, they gave the kids laptops, 
these are again already you see the icon is missing there. And then the it seems the camp was then dismantled, or rather the school was dismantled. And so the children took the laptops with them, but they were able to continue to work with it. Colombia is doing quite well. It's growing quite rapidly. They're still uh, deploying project, uh, laptops. Uh, they have several thousand. Peru is one of the largest. Uh, Peru has something like 1.1 million machines all across the country. So they're one of the largest. Um, even their Ministry of Education building has a big laptop up front. So when you drive in, you see a replica of this thing, but huge. Uh, so they've invested a lot into this project. Uh, Rwanda is the largest Africa uh, project. They have 220,000 machines. And uh, because of the way they've done this, and you know, so both Peru and Rwanda, for instance, They've been at it for a while, about five years or so. And so the results are now becoming evident. And so now what's happening is uh, Kenya, Uganda, uh, Tanzania, and some of the other Eastern African countries are essentially looking to Rwanda to figure out how they did this and how they should replicate it. Uh, but Rwanda had that head start to do this. So they've done quite well. Um, Iraq has a few thousand machines. Um, Haiti has been difficult. Haiti has something like 15, 20,000 machines, but it's very difficult to communicate to go out to all these schools. In most cases, the structures are just not there. So there's no school school. And lots of small groups of uh, volunteers will go out and set up things for them. Uh, pretty much all the networking piggybacks on these 3G modems. Uh, that's how everything is come together right, in terms of network access. Uh, this is in the Solomon Islands. Their project has been quite, uh, uh, you know, uh, focused. So they're not very big, but they've been focused and they've been doing this for a long time. So they have, uh, they figured out their problems with the network going on and off, how to do offline content, how to do caching, proxying. Uh, they figured out how to do load balancing on their Wi-Fi networks, uh, so that you know you don't get crowded around one access point. But they've done a lot of those things, and then a lot of the learning that's happening from. You know, coming from the, this group here, then applies to other uh, countries around there. So even small projects like the ones in the Marshall Islands, okay, like a thousand laptops or so, a lot of the know-how comes from here. Fiji, Fiji does a lot of stuff that these guys have done. So there is definitely that thing happening, which is that it spreads around, you know, the, the know-how. And we use, we use a wiki. Um, and of course, if anybody's used a wiki, you know it's a, it's a blessing and a curse. Uh, so the wiki is, is massive, and every, anytime you ask a question, the answer is it's in the wiki. Uh, now, the challenge is, go dig through it, find it, and who knows if it's relevant or not, right? Because it hasn't been updated. So it's an ongoing problem, it's very difficult to maintain a massive wiki, but that has been the central place to store everything. Uh, Nepal has an interesting project in that all PC itself does not do anything there, so they have a group called OLE. Uh, open Learning Exchange. And they acquire laptops from OLPC, but they implement it using their approach to it. So they create their own content, their own learning uh, plans and uh, uh, material in Nepali and so on. And then they pair up with the World Food Program to do a distribution. So they'll get the machines, but then WFP puts it on their trucks to send it out to different schools. Uh, Uruguay has been a shining star they have 100% saturation in the primary school. So every child who goes to the public school system gets one of these when they start. Forever to, to keep? Yeah, to keep, it's yours. And this is your machine until you are done with primary school. And then when you move up, you would get, they have a, a variant of this called a high school machine, and then they have some other ones. But primary school, this is what you get. And uh, so they do 100% saturation. They have something like 400,000 machines or so. Not very big country. But um, the reason they are so, uh, I consider them to be so successful is, of course, they're structured, they have the money for this, and they did all those things. We are starting to see children who are coming out of this cohort doing interesting things. So for instance, one of the kids who came out of uh, this, this program with, so he must have gotten the laptop in like 07 or so, um, learned not only to how to use the machine, but also figured out the Python behind the programs. You, you can, every, every single application ships with the source code, so there's Python in there, you can put it out, make a copy. There's a small IDE, so you can put it in there, edit it, run it, 
So he started learning Python that way. By the time he finished this, he was able to apply to the Google Summer of Code, and he actually got picked. So he went to GSOC as one of the interns, which is pretty massive because he comes from a very small little village, you know, with this machine sort of working his way up. And we're starting to see more examples of that from Uruguay. So it's one of those things where if you stay with it and you focus on the methodology, it does have. Now, not everybody ended up at Google, but big deal, at least somebody did. You know? uh, they've also done a lot of other things with going outside of the machine, uh, working with the physical environment. So a lot of Lego robotics, that kind of stuff with smaller kits. Uh, there are other things you can do here where you can plug in to the microphone port. Um, uh, a jack with two wires and whatever voltage sort of goes through with a certain range can be measured here. So now you have a little measuring device. You can, for instance, do a lemon battery with two nails in a lemon and measure the voltage here. So you can take a physical world connected to this machine and do lots of interesting science experiments. Um, so they've done a lot of those interesting things and they've done well. Uh, so in fact, I'll go back and say, Uruguay has now developed a consulting model, which is if some country wants to do this, they actually go to Uruguay to figure out how. Right? And then they'll That's the open source way. <laughs> so, uh, Australia is growing quickly, so they're doing about 50,000 machines uh, in, in the next two years or so. Um, and uh, they, they, it took them a while to get started, organizational problems and so on, but they're, they're moving quite rapidly. So this would be sort of the other pockets. So at this point, I'd say, Rwanda, Uruguay, Australia, three points of focus. And then Peru has been large, lots of problems, but they have a million machines. So they're still sort of moving in that direction. And then we have a lot of smaller projects. This was funded by the UN uh, Relief Work Works Agency in the West Bank. Um, and evidently after the machines were given to the kids, their school was bombed, but then they had the machines. So they were able to take those home. Uh, so there's a map up there for manufactured units that keeps up with the SKU numbers and what got manufactured, what got shipped. Uh, I, I'd say a, a fairly high level of transparency in terms of units produced, where they go. Uh, and it's not, not so much because they want to tell you what's happening. It's got to do with uh, fixing problems. I got, a ba you know, I got a laptop where when it charges, the light doesn't come off. Okay, so that must be a specific batch. Look in the back and give me the SKU number and then we'll look it up and we'll put it in the wiki. And that grows. So now you have this long list where you can look up the number, figure out when it was produced, who made the battery, what specific problems, for firmware updates, all that stuff, uh, so that you can fix your problems yourself. Um, <clears throat> so, and this is a thing you can find on YouTube, but a lot of this goes back to Seymour Pepper. Uh, in fact, even the stuff I was talking about was Scratch. Scratch comes out of the lifelong. Um, uh, kindergarten group at the Media Lab, and the people who run it, the guy who runs it, they can all sort of trace their lineage back to Seymour Papert as being his student or working with Papert. So Scratch, Logo, Lego Mindstorms, Old BC Sugar, a lot of these things come out of thinking of Papert, uh, where it was all driven by this um, variant of constructivist learning that he called constructionism, and it was all about learning by actually doing something. So you can learn by memorizing or replicating something several times, or you can do something that helps you build your mental model and reinforce that model. Um, that becomes a point of friction in a lot of schools, because that's not how teaching happens in a lot of schools. And you know, I'm even going to say that this goes all the way up to grad school. Right? So I look at, say, primary school, elementary school, where my daughter goes to school. And it's all about conform, conform, conform. Do this, do that, sit in a box, hold up two fingers, point to this, draw this, right? Everything is in a box. At an age when they're at their creative best. Then you go off into the MBA program, let's say, in grad school, and we pay consultants to come in to induce creativity inside of you, <laughs> right? And then we go, why aren't you creative? Creativity, innovation, learning. Well, you, if you killed it back then, how is it going to happen now? So it's, it's almost like you know, not applying the approach when it was appropriate. And then, of course, you're in grad school, it's like that creativity happened. And that's ridiculous, but 
And so what happens is, a lot of these methods don't go well with the education system. So then, they go, I don't want this in my classroom. You know, where is the assessment? Where is the multiple choice? <laughs> um, and then, of course, ignoring that, you know, you address creativity, you address problem solving, you address innovation, and then those things just sort of fall into place. This is something that uh, <clears throat> I, I don't have a problem with the text being, because it's obviously just our free form. But text math, they had to go back and add all of the assessment mm -hmm. features that all the teachers are screaming about. Yeah, and there's a lot of pressure. And you know, even in their teacher's world, I sort of get what they have to deal with, because they're part of a system, and they're like, you know, I, I can't simply walk away from this. I have to conform myself to the requirements of the school system. And, you know, it varies. Some teachers will say, I'll do it exactly to a T. Others will say, I'll do it until they're happy, and then we'll do our own thing. Uh, what struck me as interesting is, yeah. Oh, I was going to say, what do you think of Montessori? Montessori? Montessori. Okay. So, both my kids go, uh, went through that system. One is still going through it. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> there's certain aspects that I've liked, which is, you know, they, they, they sort of give you this thing about you pick what you want to work with, but then you work by yourself. Uh, the working by yourself is good in a sense it gives you focus. So for instance, they'll go pull out a mat and sit on the floor and work with a thing that they want to work with. So it's, it's yours, this is your personal space, this is your focus, you work on it. I think that helps um, in terms of just focusing on the task. The thing that I haven't liked a whole lot is that um, there seems to be very little room for social learning, which is here's my mat and I'm working on this and there is your mat and you're working on your work, but we're not actually working together. And that's the part where I think uh, it could be better. But you wouldn't get that from either non as much, right? If everyone's sitting doing their... Yeah, yeah. So, for instance, you know, when we did our code with, with Scratch, one of the things that came through, you know, they sent out a bunch of emails like, tomorrow you will get this, this flyer, this handout, do this. And I was like, okay, whatever, you know, I'll just do what I want to do with Scratch, because I kind of know where this is going. But one of the useful things was they said, um, when you are in that classroom with the children, tell them about this rule which is ask three, then ask me. Which means ask three other friends to figure out what to do. And then if you can't, then you ask me. And the purpose of that was to, to encourage you know, collaboration and, and conversation, but also emphasize that coding, for instance, is, is a collaborative social activity. It's not just you sit in a corner and do your own thing. Right? You do have to, now whether you do this sitting next to somebody or you do this in IRC, that's a different story, right? Uh, like even in OPC, we've learned uh, all of us work on IRC and you know on the wiki and all that stuff. The first time we proposed that we would do a meeting face to face, most people said, "Where's the need?" I mean, I, I see people on IRC every day. Why do I have to sit on a plane and fly out to some place and meet somebody? But a hand, handful of people came, and when they did, they found that this was a this was completely different because, you know, that one person on IRC who you've talked to for about a year and a half, now you're like, oh, that's you, okay. And then you start talking and you get a better understanding of why people do what they do. And that helps, you know, the community bond. And we found that that was so much more uh, useful to have that face-to-face -face conversation. So in this case, again, you know, in, in this crash exercise, it was always like, don't ask me first. Ask people around you, solve the problem. And so that way, you know, I'm just one person in that room, but I don't have to do much. So I walk around and they do their thing. Um, yeah, so coming back to Papert, um, of course, he's done a ton of work, and a lot of the stuff goes back to what um, he's worked on. And so they did, Papert and Nicholas Negroponte did some stuff in the early days when they, you know, when they created the Media Lab, and then we we're working on this concept. The concept is interesting. Most School systems will say, here's a computer in the library, go to the library, use the computer, it will tell you what to do, right? So the computer is a source of information. It's a lot of consumption. Whereas here the focus was, it's not consumption only, it's also creation, which is you produce things. You effectively are telling the computer what to do, thereby understanding the concept of logic. So for instance, if you were using Logo or Scratch, that's exactly what you're doing. You're telling the computer what to do as opposed to simply consuming things that are coming from the computer. And there's, there's a lot of focus in these circles saying, we see the consumption side grow like crazy, and the creation side is very, very small. And that's going to lead to a lot of problems down the road. Because 
effectively you don't have the tools to create, you don't know how to use the tools to create. Hence, you know, the focus on production. Now, 2005 is when the project started. That's Nicholas Negroponte with Kofi Annan releasing that in Tunisia. That was a sort of a mock plastic box, but evidently it actually had a motherboard and a screen and was running Debian. So there was something to it back then, but it was more, more of a press thing. And then from 05 to 07 was all the cramming, which is when all the work happened to develop the board, the operating system. So they've stayed with Fedora um, because the majority of the work was done by Red Hat engineers. They were one of the partners. They brought in all the engineering. They did all the initial stuff. So they've stayed with Red Hat, and then of course, with Red Hat, you have to pay. So it sort of became, well, let's just do Fedora. As a Linux user group, you know, I'll tell you that using Fedora for a project where you cannot get to the computer remotely because it is in the middle of nowhere is a massive challenge because Fedora is great, you know, the four Fs or whatever it is, right? Friendship, fun, something. But one of the things is that it's a bleeding edge project, project, right? So you get Fedora, you run it. Oh, this thing doesn't work. Okay, it'll be in the next release. Well, you know what? I can't get to the next release in the middle of nowhere. So it's always one of those things where you know, if you're running Debian stable versus Fedora, you would get advantages and disadvantages. And more often than not, even though Fedora has given a lot of new things you know, to the project because we want to do this now, we want to do this now, that has been a challenge, which is something breaks and then you know, you're like, I don't know how we'll fix it the next time around. Um, and it's a very rapidly moving window. So some challenges there with Fedora. The five principles that they're focused on, and again, if you see something like this, there's a video about this on YouTube, which you can look at. I'll put these up there so you can share the slides. Uh, so some interesting principles. Uh, kids get to keep the laptops. Very, very important in all the projects that I've done because it gives them a sense of ownership, a sense of responsibility. Uh, the families think that this is very important. But most importantly, when the child has a laptop, uh, she can take it home. It doesn't get locked up at school. Now at school, the kind of learning that happens is, is curricular and is under the observation of a grown-up. So you're sitting there doing something and there's this person walking by looking over your shoulder. You can't do much other than just sort of focus on what you've been told to do. Now you take this home. On the way home, you can sit under the tree and now you can have a lot of fun with it. So the discovery-based learning happens outside of school largely. But as a curricular stuff happens in school. Is there anything like me that your mom's yelling, yelling at you at 11 o'clock to go to bed trying to answer no? <laughs> <laughs> right, so, so, so this has to go home, right? And one way to do that is to say it's child, child ownership, which is the child gets to keep the laptop, the ownership is with the child. Of course, there are social problems with this in, in, in a lot of families where the father is the head of the family. Now you've taken the power structure and sort of turned it a little bit by giving the child one of the most powerful things, and the family has to adapt to it. And, you know, we've seen that in the field. And it's like, yes, so be it. Um, part of the thing is that the learning that happens is so much faster with the child than with the grown-up, that if you want the stuff to stick, you go with the kid. And then in, in pretty much all the, the projects I have worked with directly, that kid will then in turn, of course, teach the rest of the family, the siblings, the parents, and usually parents will learn in the privacy of their home and not anywhere else. So if you ask them publicly, they will say, I have nothing to do with it. And then you ask the child and they go, my father was asking me about these things quietly when we were sitting together. Show me what you know. Right? And that makes sense because uh, as a grown-up, you have perhaps not gone through the school system. You're, you cannot read. And there are all kinds of challenges. You don't want to deal with that openly as, as a 40, 50 year old. But in the privacy of your home, it makes a difference. So we insist that it, sh it should go home. In fact, in some of my projects, they've come back and said, no, no, it's too expensive, we should lock it up. And I've just said, if you don't send this home, then we're not working with you. So that's, a, that's an absolute requirement that it should go home. Uh, focus on early education is, again, younger children because they learn quickly. Uh, number three is, this is sort of Negroponte's thing, which is nobody gets left out meaning 100% saturation. That's very difficult to do, especially if you don't have the money 
to saturate the entire school. So for instance, my India project, there are 1,100 children in the school. Uh, I'm a Cal State professor, so you would know. I, can't, I don't make that kind of money to go buy 1,100 laptops for kids in the school, right? But what I can do is I can donate a few laptops every once in a while, one per family. We have about 55 houses in the village. So it's actually possible to do 55 homes in the village as opposed to 1,100 children in the school. So in my India project, we actually said, forget the school, we'll just go straight to the kids at home. And we're trying to saturate the village with one more household. Number four is also difficult. A lot of places you cannot get to the internet. And if you can, it's very slow. Uh, so we've had to do a lot of stop gap things. I'll show you a few things in a minute. But number five is interesting because number five uh, effectively translates to the free and open source part. It has to be on free and open source software, otherwise it cannot propagate, it cannot adapt, it cannot change as time goes by. If you buy into a licensed product, you're stuck with it. A proprietary licensed product, and you're stuck with it, right? Free software is also licensed. You're not doing public domain here, right? Uh, so number five is effectively translates to that, that it is free software, open source. Okay. Uh, they have a whole bunch of partnerships uh, with, with a bunch of you know, companies like Sesame Street and Amazon and Invesco and World Food Program and all that. But for me, these are the two important ones. So we have a memorandum of understanding with OPC uh, through San Francisco State uh, to work on different projects, research, uh, student internships, uh, thesis projects and so on in the you know, hopes that we can increase the footprint. Uh, and then I worked with the University of the West Indies in Jamaica I went there on my sabbatical leave and started some projects there. So that is my other uh, sort of uh, foot in the door with them. So we have two MOUs with OPC and most of the work I do is through those MOUs. What's your connection to, to Jamaica? Uh, I went there in 2006 for a conference and uh, they have a PhD program which they have not been able, they were not able to find enough uh, advisors to keep the pool uh, diverse enough. So if you have only three advisors and all of them do knowledge management, then all your doctoral students will do knowledge management. So they wanted to sort of create some variety. So they said, we'll do a conference, come work with our students. So I went there, started working with some PhD students, and then that created a channel. In 2008, then I went there for my sabbatical leave, and that's when we started the first OPC class. And then I keep going every six months or so uh, and continue. Well, then, as Bill had said, or to me on email, please do ask questions. You know, don't have to wait too long. Uh, so that's a memorandum of understanding, kind of an official looking thing. Uh, but the focus is essentially for Jamaica is Jamaica and the wider Caribbean, and it's education, technology, and community outreach. So research, internships, student projects, you know, the works. So at this point, it's basically like anything that is interesting to both parties, we sort of jump into it and see if we can get it going. So we started pilot studies in Jamaica. Um, this was the first one in Augustown, that's the first school. Uh, and there was another one. So these children are grade four, and these children are kindergarten, about five and a half to six. So we start that early. Now this kid here uh, figured out how to open the Python IDE. It's, it's, a, it's a very simple IDE called Pippi. Uh, and go into these sample programs there for Pong, right? And then figure out that you can change the numbers and change the speed of the ball and the patterns and all this. Five and a half. And then of course he goes around showing everybody and his teachers are like, we have no idea what he's doing. He's doing something and we have no clue. So he sort of becomes the star, you know, programmer there, the Python programmer there uh, at five and a half. Um, but more interestingly, this is the one kid that they had the trouble with because he would not sit still and do his work. Because whatever they would give him was not challenging enough. Now he's got this 